Hey kids, today we're talking about Kubernetes. Can you spell Kubernetes? Yeah, me neither. That's why we just write K8S, because between the K and the S in Kubernetes, there are eight letters, but nobody knows what the hell they are. Seriously though, in your job interview, you're gonna come across Kubernetes, so today I'm gonna tell you what employers are looking for whenever they put Kubernetes on their job description, how I interview for Kubernetes skills, and then I'm gonna give you some tips that you can go and implement on your own to build up your Kubernetes skills if you need to do so. Hey, what's up? I'm Will from DevOps for Developers, and on this channel, I talk about all things DevOps, from how to interview for DevOps jobs, how to land that first DevOps job, and how to implement DevOps across your entire organization. And in this video, we're talking about the interview skills that you need for Kubernetes. So Kubernetes goes deep. I mean, it's a massively complex topic. And so one of the first things to understand whenever you get into the interview is understand where the employer or the interview is at in their Kubernetes journey. One of the things I like to tell people is that if you have an orchestration problem and you install Kubernetes, now you have two problems. So you kind of got to get a feel for where your employer or interviewer is at in that process. You also need to understand where, what implementation of Kubernetes they have. Did they build this themselves on bare metal or running it on their own EC2 instances in AWS or are they using something managed like EKS in Amazon or GKE from Google? So Kubernetes is a lot like climbing a mountain. You know, at one point you're on the internet and you see this picture of a mountain climber taking a selfie from the top of the mountain and it just looks great. And you're like, yeah, I'm doing that. But then five days into this journey, you know, you're stuck on the side of a mountain where it's freezing cold. You can't talk to anyone because you're all tied in a line so that no one falls off the mountain. You're frozen to the bone. The wind's howling. It's cloudy everywhere and you can't even see a damn thing. And then you start to realize that you could have gotten the same exact experience by just going to Costco and running into one of the freezer rooms until you're freezing your ass off. But had you actually done that, you could have just left the freezer room and found one of those sweet little old ladies with the tray of sausages on a stick and made your whole world better. Remember though that this is just my opinion and I say that just to make sure that you're going out and you're getting content and videos and blog posts from other people in the Kubernetes space as well. So that you get this wide ranging uh, array of experiences to help you understand Kubernetes from different perspectives and pick up different tips and tricks from everyone presenting on this topic. So back to the reason that you're being interviewed for Kubernetes skill. So obviously the employer has chosen to use Kubernetes and it's important to understand what their motivation was in doing so. So you're gonna to want to ask questions to discover what that is. Do they have like their own data center and Kubernetes was the best way for them to solve an orchestration problem? Or did they have another third party provider that they were using and they migrated off of that onto Kubernetes? And are they running it on bare metal or using a hosted solution? You also wanna dig in and find out what kind of in-house Kubernetes expertise they already have. Are they looking for you to supplement an existing team of engineers who are managing and orchestrating Kubernetes? Or are you the first guy on the block because they've let their engineering team install Kubernetes and it's gotten out of control and they don't, they don't really know how to wrangle it into shape at this point? That's gonna help you understand what the expectations of this are. And I keep saying that and I really think it's important for you to remember that the whole purpose of a job interview is not just for them to interview you as a candidate, but for you to interview them as a potential employer. You may find that this is not the right job for you, and it's better to find that out during the interview process than after you've taken that job. So now there are some basics to running Kubernetes, and I'm talking about things like pods. You should know what a pod is, and you should know about running containers in pods and understand the service model or how to build services in Kubernetes. For me though, I expect everyone on the engineering team to have that level of understanding Kubernetes. You know, if Kubernetes is the way that we deliver our software to our customers, I expect everyone writing code and working on that, that application to have that level of knowledge. If Kubernetes were a car, those features to me are the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the turn signals. 
Although if you launch Kubernetes with the dash dash BMW switch, then there's no need for turn signals. When you interview with me for that, we're gonna cover those basics just so that I know that you know what those basics are. And then we're gonna dig into some deeper, more fundamental administration type tasks on Kubernetes. We're gonna dig into the components, talking about things like the control plane and nodes, how you add and remove nodes. And we're gonna talk about the add-ons, things like DNS and the web UI, cluster level logging and monitoring. I also like to dig into the role that etcd plays in Kubernetes because it's a fundamental part of Kubernetes and I'm gonna dig in to make sure that you know how to secure etcd too because there's a lot of information in there that can be used to, um, you know, to hijack your Kubernetes system or to do privilege escalation. So I wanna make sure that you know how to secure the data that's stored in etcd. And then we'll talk about some usage type stuff, you know, and that's gonna vary a lot by the provider, whether you're running Kubernetes on bare metal or using a hosted solution like GKE or the EKS solution from Amazon. The things that we'll talk about there are, you know, adding and removing nodes, how you provision those nodes, and the security permissions around those nodes when you're bringing them into the cluster and making sure that they're secure. Storage is a huge part of Kubernetes, so we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. And by storage, I'm specifically referring to like your application storage. If you're running a database service inside of Kubernetes, it's gonna have a mounted volume where it writes its data to, and so we're gonna talk about the different storage classes in Kubernetes, how you create storage classes, which storage classes you use based on your implementation, and then dig into persistent volumes and persistent volume claims and talk about the different types of claims that you can have on those volumes so that I know you have a good understanding of how you can create a claim on a volume and govern access to who can or can't access that volume once it's been claimed. As we move the conversation into security, there are the four C's of security. There's code level, container level, cluster level, and cloud level, although cloud level could also mean bare metal, but that doesn't start with C, so we still use a C there. And then there's the security around your pods, and we cover that by talking about namespaces and running your pods or the containers in your pods as non-root users. And then we'll bring that back into talking about the volumes again and how you can control which volumes are available to pods to ensure that a pod can't be launched with a volume mount to something that it shouldn't have access to. Now, depending on our exact implementation, there could be quite a conversation about API access. When it comes to API access, you can either choose to restrict and lock that down or leave that pretty promiscuous. We can talk about different things like API access for not only the engineering team, but also API access from other services like your CI CD server or API access from a pod inside the container, what level of access it has. And that could dig down into RBAC or role-based access control. If you've got a really tightly configured Kubernetes system, you're gonna have lots of roles and those roles are gonna be given access to do different things. So we'll talk about the permission level there, how you implement that, and also how you check that to ensure that the roles only have access to the things that they need. Depending on how the interview has gone up to this point, we may go into some advanced topics like quotas and policies and resource limiting because within Kubernetes, you can define all of those things to ensure that some pods or containers within pods can't grow out of control and start consuming more resources and starve other pods on that same cluster from resources. And so you do that with limits and quotas. And I consider that a little bit of an advanced topic that really a lot of the smaller to medium sized companies using Kubernetes don't really run into. So it's not necessarily a mandatory skill for every implementation, but it's something that does exist. So now the big question, if you don't have these skills or you need to brush up on these skills, how can you do it? The easiest way is to launch your own cluster. And if you don't have the hardware available to do that, you can use something like GKE or AWS EKS, but that involves some costs. You gotta make a decision for yourself and how much money you can or are willing to invest 
into building these skills if you're gonna go that route. I totally get that not everyone has the ability to launch and run a cluster just for learning purposes. So if you can't do that, we can still get there through some other ways. For example, if you're using Docker Desktop, you can turn on Kubernetes mode in that and it will run a Kubernetes cluster for you. You can also download and run something like Minikube to get the same experience running locally. Or one other way you can do that is if you have the resources on your computer, you can launch virtual machines using VirtualBox or Windows Microsoft Hyper-V or something like that. Bring up those nodes as virtual machines and then install those as, as a Kubernetes cluster. Once you have that cluster up and running, you wanna do some preliminary things like just get a service running up on there, you know, launch a database service on it, launch a web application on it, and then get some operational experience, you know, kill the containers, kill a pod, see what happens. Go find out where the logs are being written, how you understand or how you access those logs and get really, really familiar with the cube control command because that gives you all of your API access into Kubernetes and it's how you do a lot of things operationally. So get really comfortable with what commands and subcommands are available within that, as well as using the web UI to visualize and monitor your cluster. With it up and running, you can start building out storage classes and you can create persistent volumes and mount those to your pods and then start doing some deployments on there where you mount those persistent volumes to different deployments and then tear that down, reattach something else to it and ensure that you still have your data there. You'll also wanna play with the different service types and build services as a node port or with cluster IP and get an understanding for what the load balancer does. And there's also an ingress that you can build and I really like that because there's a lot of services in Kubernetes that you probably run but don't access on a regular basis. And I'm talking about things like Postgres or Elasticsearch or RabbitMQ. You probably shouldn't be accessing those as an external user every single day. If you are, that's probably a good indicator that you need to be figuring out why that is and solving some code related issue that's leading you to do that. But you still need access to those services and you need that exposed externally. So personally, I don't like to pay for a load balancer for things that I'm not accessing regularly. So you can build out an ingress service where you can have all of those services exposed through a single load balancer to help you manage costs. So it may not sound like it, but that was actually a ton of information and can lead to a really long learning curve for you or a significant amount of time spent learning Kubernetes and that's okay. My goal in this video was just to give you some of the high level concepts, knowing full well that you'll say, oh, here's this high level concept, I'm gonna go do that. Oh wait, to do that I have to learn this. Oh. To understand that, I have to learn this, and it's just gonna take you right down the rabbit hole that is Kubernetes. And that's okay, that was kind of my goal with all of this, um, just to give you some high-level things to go search for, to learn how to do, knowing that that's gonna open up a whole level of learning opportunities below that. So don't get frustrated or discouraged whenever you discover that. That's just kind of the beast that is Kubernetes. It's also why I recommend Kubernetes being the last thing that you learn when you start learning about DevOps. Be sure and check out the playlist that I've got for the other interview skills for a DevOps job and make sure that you master those before you jump into Kubernetes because understanding those is gonna make understanding Kubernetes a lot easier and it's gonna make your learning process go a lot faster. So there you go, that should get you going and uh, I'll see y'all in the next video.